Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Slasher Street Podcast. And I am so buzzing to be joined today by the writer, producer, director of the 1984 slasher classic, one of my favorite standalone slasher movies of all time, The Mutilator, and as of course the legendary Buddy Cooper. Buddy, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, how are you doing tonight? Uh, uh, Ryan, I'm doing very well. Thank you. I uh, hope you are. And uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here. I'm looking forward to this. It's going to be fun. Excellent. Excellent. It's uh, it's something that we've been wanting to do for a while on the podcast. It's been, uh, we normally cover kind of horror movies in general and we try and get a couple of interviews on. But this year, I was really uh, wanting to get, you know, a few more guests on, make it a bit bigger and uh you were one of my first choices, so I really, really am grateful that you've uh, gave my up your time for me this afternoon. My pleasure. Perfect. So uh, I suppose the... Um... Oh, sorry, carry on. One, sec- one second. I need to reach over here. It's getting kind of warm at my place. I'm going to turn the heat off. Ah, thank you. Perfect, perfect. I've literally just done that myself. I had a little heater on in the corner there, and I've just uh, turned it off as well because it was getting red hot in here, so... <laughs> Right, so I suppose the uh, the best place to start is, you know, where all good stories start at the beginning. So um, did you always, you know, want to be in the business of making movies and, and be a director? <clears throat> That's two questions. Uh, <laughs> yes, I always did want to be, I always wanted to be in or make movies. Uh, I, I never actually saw myself as a director, but I knew I was good. I had... I knew I had to make movies. <laughs> I don't know how else to put it. It was there and it had to be dealt with. It turned out that uh, I, I, I turned out to be the director. Okay, that's good. I, 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 uh, I was happy to try that. I don't know, that's kind of a short answer without my <laughs> biography, but it's, it's there, that's all there is. Yeah, no, that's cool, that's cool. So you were always, uh, it, was a, it was a dream to be a director, you were always into movies uh, growing up and that kind of thing? Yeah, uh, yeah, I grew up in the movies, I loved them. Uh, uh, I grew up, we didn't have television, if, you know, and I'm happy to say I was around in those days. <laughs> uh, and so uh, we would go to movies. Movies were short; uh, they were roughly about an hour long in that time. And on Saturday, it would be a double feature, and that's where I spent my Saturdays. I grew up in the movies, uh, loved them, loved them, still do. Perfect. And we we always a, a fan of the the horror genre. I was yes. Uh, the I think the first movie I saw was a double feature at a drive-in near here that my father had an interest in, a financial interest. And he took my sister Annette and me to watch the Bella Lugosi Dracula and uh, Wolfman with Long Chaney Jr. And just scared me <laughs> terribly. And my sister's canines were uh, long enough so that she could hold her lips in a way that would hide all of her teeth except the points of her canines. And she looked like a vampire. She would do that to me. She was two years older than I was. I just told boy, she scared the pee out of me. I swear she did. And then I couldn't go to sleep at night because the wolf man was in my closet. <laughs> and I knew he was going to come get me. But I, I knew enough about the movie to know that. And I told myself, I said, he's not that big. He's really this big. And so if he comes out of the closet, I'll just step on him. So that's how I managed to get to sleep that night. And I've been a fan of horror movies ever since. Awesome. Awesome. So um, you obviously, we'll get, we'll get onto it. We'll get onto uh, you going into making your own movie, but was making a horror movie always something that you wanted to do? Or was that just something that kind of spontaneously no, happened? Yeah, no, it was uh, the decision to make a horror movie was uh, an economic decision at the time. Weekly Variety was reporting that 30% of the tickets sold in this country were being sold for low-budget horror pictures. I had read an in-depth article in the New York Times about film school. I was going to send myself to film school uh, to to learn how to make movies. And uh, the article concluded by saying, as great as these film schools are, if you can get a job on a sheet, you'll learn more 
working on a shoot for one movie than you will in four years of film school. So I took the money that I was going to use to send myself to film school and uh, decided to make a movie. Uh, as an interesting aside, I was looking at a, a vineyard in Bordeaux at the time. I had $84,000. The dollar and the franc had really swapped. So $84,000 was a lot, of, a lot of francs at the time. There was a vineyard for sale for 100000 and I had to decide whether to buy the vineyard or to make a movie. And I said, eh, I'm gonna make a movie. <laughs> first, <laughs> first things first. And uh, because of the reporting that Variety had done, I decided to make a little bit of our picture, thinking that I would have a better chance of getting my money out, being able to make a second one. And by the time I made two, I would know something about how to make a movie. That was the plan. That's how I got it. That's how the horror movie genre came in. Came into being. That's what. I, that's how. That's why. That's why the new later too. Yeah. Thankful. I mean, I, I, I mean, you might have a different opinion on it in terms of I don't know the. I mean, maybe not all these years later, it, we're still here talking about it. But I think you made the right decision making the mutilator and bringing that joy to the world rather than <laughs> drinking wine and. You know. I uh, thank you for that. I think that the new leader has been well received, and I'm I'm happy with that. And I made some friends on that thing. I, I had some made some lifelong friendships on that shoot. I'm still in touch with these people, uh, not daily, but I'm very close to some of the people that we work with on that awesome. shoot. So I, it was the right decision. Yeah. And I quit drinking wine. So there you go. Well, there you go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you know, we'll never quit the mutilator. You know, and you'll never, <laughs> no, we're, you'll we're never need watching. to go to. Uh, Seek help for watching the mute later. So <laughs> maybe we're alcohol, you might. <laughs> I saw, I saw a, a joke on YouTube uh, last week. It said, I went to, um, I attended Alcoholics Anonymous meeting Thursday night. Anonymous hell, I knew everybody there. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I know what you mean. That was the best one. And also, it's the one where they say, I've got an alcohol problem. It's like, you know, I've been drinking every single day for the past 20 years. If I had a problem, I would know. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, um, yeah. <laughs> the, uh, we'll get on to the video. So how did the, how did the initial idea, so we, we obviously the idea was to make a, a low budget <laughs> movie that would uh, give you the most chance of breaking even or making making your money back. So how did the initial idea behind the mutilator or the call <laughs> break at the time uh, come along? Uh, I live at the beach where both the mutilator and mutilator 2 were shot at Atlantic Beach, North Carolina. I live right on the, on the ocean. And uh, it's a popular beach. There are a lot of people here. Labor Day is one of the four big weekends, Labor Day weekend. And Labor Day weekend, we were elbow to elbow with people and glad of it. I'm not, I'm, I'm not complaining. It was just a popular tourist spot. But the day after Labor Day, my friend Johnny Dennis and I were walking on the beach, and it was barren. You could look a mile in, in either direction, and there were no, there was nobody. And that's when it occurred to me. You know, the uh, formula for low budget horror pictures at the time was you get get a group of young people in an isolated setting and pick them off one at a time. And so I was thinking, well, we're on an island and it's isolated. If somehow the bridge were to malfunction, then it would really be isolated. This would be a good spot to have a horror movie. And since, since we're here at the beach, the implements of death should be nautical in nature as much as possible. And that's how it came about. I, I started talking about it, started jotting some notes down, and the next thing you know, I was writing a screenplay based on awesome. that. That's how it happened. Yeah. And um, I suppose, like you say, we're saying that a nautical theme. I don't actually think, I mean, there's probably go like, uh, you know, ship based horror films, but I don't think there's another. I suppose I suppose uh, the fisherman from uh, I know what you did last summer, but they he you know you could say that they potentially stole elements from the mutilator by taking that fisherman and the nautical theme. You know, I don't think there's been another nautical themed slasher movie out there apart from maybe that one, which came what fifteen years later. So yeah, uh, yeah. very original concept. Uh, good, <laughs> good. <laughs> <laughs> So, because the thing that fascinated me as well, it's it's your first movie, it's your first time behind the camera. You're the producer, the writer. 
you know, you, you everything to do with the mutilator you are. Uh, and one of the biggest kind of assets or one of the biggest things that people remember about the mutilator is obviously it's awesome kills and practical effects and the gore. Uh, and you managed to get on board uh, Mark Shawstrom, who was went on to have a phenomenal career in special effects. He's worked on Evil Dead and the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise and all that kind of great stuff. So how did you, you know, get these people on board, you know, essentially to uh, to do the special effects? Did you know them already or was it just word of mouth? I advertised. I've forgotten uh, in what paper, uh, you know, everything was paper then, nothing was online. And I got a, uh, a few people interested I narrowed it down to Mark Shostrom and some woman whose name I forget. And I was impressed with Mark. I've forgotten exactly why, but his enthusiasm. He was just starting out. Remember, this was this is not the experienced Mark Shostrom. This was a new guy. He was a newbie. And uh, he had a, 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 uh, an assistant, Anthony Chow. And we sort of agreed on things. And uh, I invited him to come. And he, and he came and he stopped along the way and visited with Dick Smith, who was someone he looked up to and Dick gave him his recipe for movie blood, which we used in Mutilator, the best movie blood there is. Uh, and uh, he landed. They, we, uh, there was a young woman who had tried for one of the roles in the picture that well, didn't make it. Uh, wanted to work on the picture, so I called her and asked her if she would be if she would be interested in being the third person in the special effects department. She said yes. So she came down. The first day she was here, her boyfriend showed up, and they had a brawl. The air was blue with the language they used, screaming, guests in the motel were complaining, and I had to take her aside. I'm sorry, this is just not going to work. You uh, you're going to have to go. She was terribly upset. She turned the air blue again, talking to me. Then. Uh, there was a guy, Ed Farrell, who had called twice and said he wanted to work on a movie. He's a movie fan. And I, I said, I'm screwed up. I just don't have anything. When something happens, I'll call you. And he called again, same answer. And he called a third time that day. And I said, well, a position had just opened up in the uh, special effects department. Would you like to be in, in this? But he jumped on it. Yeah. Turns out that was exactly what he wanted to do. It was a perfect match. And Ed and Mark Schuster became very good friends, and they stayed in touch. They, and they're still in touch through the years. And that's how that came about. Mark Schuster came here and cut his teeth on the mutilator. And we were glad to have it. He was, uh, he was willing to go the extra mile. He, he wanted it to work. He did everything he could. Not everything worked, but he <laughs> wanted everything to work. And he tried hard. He was good. He was good working with Mark. Excellent. And obviously, we're still here 30, you know, nine years later talking about the kills and the special effects in that film. So it's he obviously did a phenomenal job. And um, I don't know whether, obviously, we've got, we had, we had Mark on board who did a, an, an incredible job with the special effects, but was it always your intention to make the film as gory as, as it ended up being? Yes. Uh... I uh, was a bit of a gore fan, and I knew that there were gore fans out there, and I thought I'd make a movie for them, and that's and I did, and we got a pretty good uh, gory movie, pretty gory movie. It looked too gory for some people, uh, the MPAA, for instance, but the fans liked it. Yeah, it answered two questions. Yes, that was my yeah. intent. So you. You've touched on it briefly there, actually, so I might as well talk about it now. Um, the MPAA in the 1980s was what I would say is the, was the cancer of slasher movies. They just tore them apart and, and killed them and just wanted to take out, like I say, the best bits, the gory bits. So what was it like working with the MPAA at that time, you know, submitting the mutilator? Because presumably you submitted it uncut and then they came back with some probably ridiculous recommendations as they did with <laughs> so many of the mid early to mid 1980s slasher movies. What was, what was that kind of like working with, with those guys and what kind of uh, issues did you face? It was miserable. 
working with them. And uh, they were they were in control and they exercised their control mercilessly. Mm. Uh, they there were no written rules. They say you gotta make this difference. So well tell me what I need to do to make a difference. We don't tell you, you just do it and show it to us and then we'll tell you if we like it or not. I attended a screening at the MPAA, which had about 30 people in the audience. And the, the people were volunteers from P, PTA to local grade schools. So, you know, you want your little children to watch this? And they were being led by the nose by a couple of young women who worked with the MPAA. And they just told us to cut everything out. They were so severe, they told us to cut out a shot which was not even there. <laughs> uh, there's the shot where uh, character Ralph gets a frog gig in the throat. They said, we see this going in and that's no good. It's just not, I had to get the editor of the movie on the phone with the woman from MPAA and then they went through it frame by frame somehow. And he finally convinced her that the shot she wanted to remove wasn't there. It didn't exist at all. Just movie magic. Uh, it was terrible. And once it was done, the movie lost favor with me and the other Gore fans. And uh, it wasn't all that interesting and it didn't do well at the box office after that. I, I, by contrast, when it first opened, it first opened uh, in New York in the Northeast and uh, did well. Made it to number 13 on Weekly's Variety chart and stayed there for six weeks, I think. I was, you know, that was gratifying. And then, Nothing. So was that because, did you manage to, when it had its initial run in New York, did did you manage to kind of get it out there unrated rather than uh, having to send it to them to get, because presumably is that what you would send it to the, to them to get a rating? Or so when oh, you no, did that, New York? Mm -hmm. they, they had already offered an X rating. I oh. wanted an R, they offered an X, which I declined because at the time X meant porn. And I didn't want to be, you know, lose sales because of that. So we we opened it unrated, and that was okay. Or at least it was okay with me. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't. It wasn't all that okay with uh, the theaters. We had trouble getting. And once we left New York and L.A. and a couple other spots, we the theaters. Uh, most of them are chains, I suppose, at, at least at the time, were chains and were under the thumb of the big houses. And uh, most of them refused to show it because it was unrated. The few brave souls who agreed to show it because it was unrated suffered because we had trouble getting uh, advertising in the newspapers and on radio and television. And when we could get advertising on newspapers, radio, and television. Often it was canceled. And when, the, when the advertising was canceled, the theater canceled the booking. So we was, it was a terrible, uh, it was a morass of problems. It was terrible. <laughs> I just, I think it, <laughs> and, even today, we're only just now getting to the point where theaters are becoming more comfortable showing unrated movies and kind of, <clears throat> they know the audience for that. So I can imagine in, 1984, it would have just been a complete, you know, nightmare, especially working with those kind of people. It's, yeah, no good. I mean, yeah. did um, did you ever get any pushback from, like, family or friends or locals? Or I suppose you touched on it there, theatres, due to how gory the film was, or? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, uh, an interesting story, which I've told before, is that in the uh, well-known gaff scene there near the end where the, where the girl gets the big gaff, uh, the uh, DP's younger sister was the boom operator. And she said she wasn't going to work on that. She wasn't going to be there. She went, in fact, <laughs> we're set up. Everybody's in position, camera's ready to roll. And... Uh, she laid the boom down, said, I'm not going to do it. They walked off the set, and her brother, the DP, walked out there and talked to her, but she came back and we shot it. But there was a lot of talk on the set that this is too much, it's too rough. But 
everybody shot it anyhow. I mean, it, shoot, it's a movie, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. They're not really. <laughs> yeah. And I can imagine yeah. as well, like, it's, it's, don't try this at home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's hard to, because uh, I couldn't imagine someone in that mindset because essentially when you're, I mean, I've never been on a movie set, unfortunately, but you're seeing how the cake is made when you're on the movie set. For us watching the film, we're like, ooh, ooh, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that's, that's, you know, that's a, <laughs> that's a tough one. But when you're on the set, it's not quite as, you know, I say you see how the cake's made, you know the girl is fine. <laughs> so yeah. it always uh, kind of, it's crazy to think that someone would, would walk off. But again, that pro- does that probably just speak for the effects and I suppose the kill at the time was next level stuff. Uh, she came back. That's not going. <laughs> um, so we'll talk a bit about the cast of the original Mutilator. We're, we're going to absolutely get into the Mutilator too and talk all about that. But the uh, the cast of the original Mutilator, the kids, they all seem to have really great chemistry. Uh, all of them, uh, you know, they seem to uh, look like friends. And sometimes with early to mid 80s low budget slasher films sometimes the uh, the acting and the chemistry can feel quite forced but it, i think that is another thing that speaks for the mutilator is that the, the acting and the chemistry between them doesn't feel forced so it feels quite natural so what was uh, the process of casting those kids because obviously you were a local it was filmed local did you know who you wanted to use already or did you go out completely blind uh, just to try and have a full on casting process what was kind of behind that I desired to cast as many roles as I could locally and did cast a few. The, uh, the cop who, who the deputy who becomes be- decapitated was, is a local guy. He came on in early. He was in, uh, Ben Moore, he was in uh, 2000 Maniacs back when, and he, he did a little TV with Jack Webb. And uh, he was, uh, Full of shtick. He, he should have been in Bill. He was going the whole time. What a great guy. He kept us going. Uh, and he he selected the girl who played uh, the Bucks and Blonde, Connie Rogers. And then we then the well ran dry. I expanded my area of search to eastern North Carolina. Picked up Ruthie Martinez at East Carolina University. She's a senior. In fact, her, we couldn't shoot her scenes. Her scenes were delayed a few days while she was taking her final exams. And we also picked up the great Jack Chatham from Greensboro. And still, we needed a place to go. So I put an ad in uh, uh, Bre- Breakdown Services, which was a tabloid at the time. We were having an open casting call in New York City. Hired a little studio, and three of us went up there with our VHS camera, you know, big shots. We're, we're <laughs> casting a movie here. And seven people showed up. But oh. believe it or not, two of those people were uh, Francis Reigns and Matt Midler, who were hired. Uh, right? They came. They were on. And that just about filled it up, except for Ralph. Uh, and it was getting close. We were about we were less than two weeks away from shooting and Ben Moore and I were in my office talking about it and wondering about what we're going to do. We don't have a Ralph yet. And, uh, I, I was a lawyer and my, one of my paralegals walked in and said, there's a guy out front. Here's your making a movie. He wants to be in it. <laughs> yeah, I thought, hey, okay, we'll send him in. <laughs> and in walked, uh, Bill Hitchcock and Bill at the time was a magician. And we started talking. He had the patter, and we started talking. And, and he said he knew card tricks. I happen to have a deck of cards in my desk. I pulled it out and tossed it to him. He uh, he took those cards. He made those cards sing and dance. I've never seen anything like it. He was doing stuff. I don't know how he did it. I don't want to know how he did it. It was <laughs> amazing. And I looked and I looked at Bill. I said, "This guy is Ralph." We didn't. He didn't have. He was B. This this is Ralph. We you're Ralph. You're hired. And he said okay, and that's how the 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 main part of the crew came together, uh, and they 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 all became friends, and they stayed in close contact for the years. They stayed in close contact. A couple of them did. Maury Lampley came from North Carolina. He did. 
Connie Rogers died a little over a year ago. Uh, Jack Chatham considered himself aged out. So he, he came down and watched a shoot for a day, but he didn't, uh, he didn't perform in, mm. uh, in Mutilator 2. Uh, the, the deputy in Mutilator 1 who gets his leg cut off at the end is one of my, my best pal from law school. He uh, lost a leg in Vietnam. He was a West Pointer, Airborne Ranger. And uh, we were talking, and I, he said, what are you doing? I said, I'm going to make a movie, a horror movie. He said, I'll do a leg for you. I said, <laughs> okay. So he came down, and that's how that happened. That was another uh, actor from North Carolina. But uh, I guess that answers the question. Yeah, and he's he's in the trail. And we're going to, obviously, I said, we'll, we'll carry on with the mutilator, the original at the moment. We'll get on to the mutilator too, but he's in the trailer. Uh, you can see him walking down the boardwalk with the leg, and I was like, that's great attention to detail. He's got his police outfit on the same as he did in the original. I was like, that's a fantastic callback. <laughs> I'm glad you like it. Yeah. <laughs> I hope everybody does. I hope so. I, I'm sure we will. I'm sure we will. Uh, so speaking of a bit more of the, the cast in a sense, the the original Mutilator is a bit of a, a family affair for the Coopers. Uh, your okay. wife is in the film. Your, your ex-wife, I believe, was in the film. Your son's in the film. Your daughter's in the film. Your dad's in the film, and even you're in the film for like a shot, a very brief second. Um, so what was kind of did, did did you have to talk them round to get on board, or were they just ready to get stuck in from the start? Well, let's let's not pass over my other sister who was in the makeup department. Oh, sorry, sorry. And uh, my uh co-director John Douglas said to me, buddy. Most people make home movies in Super 8. We have to use 35 movies. I didn't have to talk anybody into it. Uh, everybody was happy to support. I guess uh, Pam, my former wife, was helping with catering, helping with the wardrobe, helping with something else. Meanwhile, she had her own business she was running and raising and taking care of two children in a household while I was off making movies. And uh, the woman I'd hired to play that role called two days before the shoot of that take of that scene was to take place, and said that she was a fine, upstanding Christian woman and she just couldn't be in a movie like New Later. <laughs> so I went to Pam. I said, Pam, uh, I need you to do one more thing for the movie. She said, What? <laughs> <laughs> I said, I need for you to get shot and die. <laughs> and she, she said, okay. And she did a great job. I mean, she really did. So uh, now I asked my dad, who for his entire life has uh, taken a nap. I mean, he's, he's dead now, but I, I, he always took a nap around two in the afternoon. And we were shooting, asking if he wanted to, to do what his part. He said, yeah. So we showed up and we're over there and we're running late behind schedule. It's getting late and he's kind of old and, and we're getting past his nap time, on past his nap time. And so I, I called him and I said, Dad, look, I know it's your nap time. Don't worry about it. You don't have to stay. We can do this without you. He said, oh, no, no, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. So he looked forward to it. He had a ball. Everybody did. Uh, my daughter, who played a little uh, cheerleader, had a good time. She has a better part in New Letter 2. Oh, okay. She, she's in the trailer. She's a trained professional chef. She is a restaurateur. She and her husband have a restaurant that is well known and, and enjoys a well deserved uh, reputation. Amos Mosquitoes Restaurant and Bar in Atlantic Beach, North Carolina. If you're ever in town, be sure to look them up. It was featured on uh, diners, drive ins, and dives. A month or so ago, uh, she's in it. She just she she played the chef in it. Uh, oh, excellent! <laughs> who else was? Oh, my sister was in makeup, and she was a stand-in in one particular scene. And Trace, of course, played the boy Ed, who who shoots his mother. That's it. Everybody was happy to do it. One, the only problem, the only pushback I got was one day. There's a scene where the the kid gets his uh, throat cut with the with the battle axe and the bad guy the killer big ed is having a, a reverie about that and we were 
trying to shoot that plus get set up for something else and we were getting set up for something else. And I noticed Trace had a little tear in his eye. I said, what's the matter, son? He said, I've got homework to do. <laughs> it was late in the afternoon, you know. I said, okay, kill the kid. <laughs> <laughs> that was the only pushback uh, from family that I had. Yeah, they all they all supported, all behind it. Yeah, and they same for this one. Everybody's happy. Everybody loves it. Everybody. I think you're the only director in in history that's probably had, uh, well, I suppose it was a dream scene, but still killed your son and your wife in (laughs) the same film. (laughs) uh, That reminds me, I used to have a fraternity brother who was famous for his witticisms, and one day he said, if I had killed my wife the first time I thought about it, I'd be out by now. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, okay, Smokey, never mind. (laughs) Excellent. So, um, so obviously, the mural era was your first time behind the camera. You wrote, produced, directed the whole movie, and uh, you were uh, bankrolling the movie. It was completely, you know, your money or eighty, eighty four thousand dollars or eighty six thousand dollars. I think both those figures have been thrown out. I, I think it was eighty four. Eighty four. And I, I thought I could make a movie for eighty four thousand dollars. <laughs> Were you close? Were you close? <laughs> <laughs> it lasted about a week. <laughs> I uh, went on all my credit cards, went to the went to the bank. Wachovia was very helpful. They gave me all the money I needed on my signature without any collateral. And I'll say that when I when I finally got the bank paid off, I went over and paid them off. Every officer in the bank came by and shook my hand. <laughs> <laughs> They had no collateral, uh, but it was fun. It was good. Yeah, it was, it was hard. It took a while to pay it off. Thank you, yeah. MPAA. Yeah, yeah. Um, so did you find that, I suppose, because you didn't have any big studios to answer to, uh, it was all you. You were the man in charge, and it was your ca- cash. Did, did you find that easier, kind of less stressful, like being able to do it your own, your all your own way, or would you have preferred... I don't know, well, someone else doing that. Yeah, well, well, yeah, well, it's a mix. Uh, of course, I was concerned about the money. Mm. It would have been, I would, it would have been uh, more relaxing if it had been somebody else's money. But having really one person ultimately make decisions is a very efficient way to do it. Mm. Uh, if we if you got a special effect that doesn't work, and we had a couple. And somebody comes up with some ideas on the spot. Look, we, yeah, we'll, let's do that. We'll do that. Uh, instead of having to call uh, an executive in charge, at some I don't know how it works, but instead of having to call other people and sit down and delay and wait, no, no, no. It's just let's get it done. Let's do it. And we'll do it this way. Yeah, it, it, I think it's a very efficient way to, to do it. Yeah. It's expensive, yeah. It's expensive but it's efficient. <laughs> I so I mean the uh, so the movie. Oh, that's cool. Um, were you moving the camera? Did you say that? Sorry. <laughs> I, I, oh, sorry. I just heard me. The <laughs> <different> camera. <laughs> sorry. Wait, 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 I, got old, <laughs> I, I got an old deer hot here. I'm gonna ah, yes. That's, that's not there. Oh, there we go. <laughs> so the movie debuted on. I think we've actually just passed the 39th anniversary. It was the 6th of January, 1984. So we're only, you know, what's that? Six days ago was the 39th anniversary of the premiere of The Mutilator. And uh, did you think uh, back then that you would still be here 39 years later talking about the movie? Did you think it would leave that lasting legacy? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, no, I did not. I'm glad that it has, though. I really am. I feel good about it, but no. I, I don't know what I was expecting, but I wasn't expecting that. Well, I know I was expecting them to make a few million dollars, you know, go on and make some real movies, but that didn't happen. But I certainly didn't expect it to become uh, as popular as it has to, do, to develop the legs that it did. And a lot, as you have said earlier, uh, a large part of that is due to Arrow Films. Yeah, bring bringing out the the, the, the CD Blu-ray. Should I have oh, it's the camera you tell them the, Oh, you can't tell them the camera. Oh, there we go. Oh, there we go. There, <laughs> there it is. is. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. Can't really There's tell a, on here with the bad picture, but 
there's a guy, Ewan Kent, who worked for Arrow. You know Ewan? No, of him? not personally, but I know of him. Yes, yeah. Yeah, he was. Uh, I guess he was in charge of acquisitions or something, and special packages. And I was talking with some woman at Shout Factory, and Ewan called me up, and we hit it off. I mean, right on the spot. And I, we had a deal on one phone call, I think. He said, uh, what do you need for an advance? I said, well, you know, the first guy who mentions the number always the guy who loses. He said, how about 10000 I said, okay. <laughs> but, you know, that's, about a, that's about as much negotiation as went on. And we had a deal. Of course, they needed a lot of paperwork. I said, I'm all that. Even came over, picked up a cameraman in New York and came down and supervised some of the interviews that are on that package. After he left, he had some uh, requests, which I did. I, I shot an interview and uh, some some other things and sent to him. And he put together one heck of a package. I understand he's no longer at Arrow now that he is with Vinegar Syndrome doing something similar. But he's he's in he's in Mutilator too. He called, he said, hey, can I be? Yeah, come on. <laughs> he's, a, he's a good guy well I will say <clears throat> that uh, and I've said this on, on the podcast as well this Blu-ray package for me I mean Arrow in my opinion do the best transfers so I feel like you've you kind of entrusted the right company in bringing the Mutilator to Blu-ray and bringing this new package out but for me personally I own a lot of the Arrow releases from the old kind of the uh, you know the mid '80s slashers that they they do about bring those ones out. This is the best one, like in terms of the package they put together. It's this superb. is the best one. It's really good. Yes, brilliant. And uh, uh, let's mention in passing that the color timing was done by Vinegar Syndrome in Connecticut. They, uh, we went by the old VHS because the timing, the color was so good on that. They, they played that, and I went up and sat with the guy for a day. And pointed out some things, and they did a really good job working for Arrow Video. Definitely. This uh, did you expect it? We, as so, you've kind of answered the question. I was going to say, did, were you happy with the finished product? But this has yeah, really yeah. kind of shot the Mutilator back into the public. It the did in the last five years. It did. It it uh, afforded the old fans a good, clear movie to watch, and it opened it up to a whole bunch of new fans. So uh, yeah, I'm I'm really happy that they brought it out. Yeah. One thing um, that I, I think sometimes it's a bit of a sometimes a detriment to Arrow, but it depends on what you like as a film. But sometimes the cover art on some of the other releases they do isn't it's so good. Like the cover art on all Arrow releases is so good and so eye catching. It's very reminiscent of kind of the late 1980s video stores. You know when you have the really eye-catching front cover. and uh, But Arrow usually bring out a new front cover for their Blu-rays, for whichever film it is, whereas the Mutilator uses the same poster that you you used in 1984 because it's so good. <laughs> it's like such a perfect poster by sword, by pick, by axe, by by. Fantastic, you know, slogan, brilliant eye-catching poster. So I suppose the question is, how did you come up with the poster and the marketing campaign? Because this is an awesome poster in 2023, let alone 1984. <laughs> well, uh, to uh, to tell the complete story, you have to look at the uh, the other. You know, the original poster for Fall Break is included in that same package. Both of them are in there. Yeah. So uh, a guy named Marvin Friedlander was going to distribute it. And Marvin said, uh, Bud, I need, we need a, you know, we need, a, we need a promo package. We need advertising. We got, I said, I got it. He said, what do you got? I said, we got everything. Got radio spots, got TV spots, got a poster, got a trailer. He said, let me see it. So I showed it to him. And he said, Bud, I got to tell you, it's shit from top to bottom. I thought, oh, wait a minute now. We worked hard on this. And he sent me around the corner to uh, Diener Hauser Bates Advertising Company on Times Square, I think. And they came up with the poster and the tagline. Some secretary came up with it. Diener <laughs> Hauser Bates came up with it. And it's, uh, you know, it's great. It really is. I can say that because I didn't come up with it. I wish I had. 
<laughs> and if anybody if anybody else asks, I'll take credit for it. But it is uh, it's really good. It really is. And the post records that you know tells tells the story. Oh yeah, yeah definitely. It's awesome. And so you've said it there. The movie originally was called Fall Break. And even in the opening credits, it's still called Fall Break. Uh, which is, is I love that Fall kind Break. of stuff. I love that kind of stuff. I mean, when you put a film in and it says a totally different name on the title. I, personally, as a big 80s slasher fan, I love that kind of stuff. I think it's brilliant. Uh, what was if, I, if we'd had somebody else's money, we probably would have changed it. Yeah. <laughs> But um, what was obviously? I actually think Fall Break is a great name um, because you've touched on it before. Um, I think you touched on it in the in the documentary actually, where it's Fall Break, Fall Over, and Break Something. It has a bit of a sinister tone to it. I think that's cool as well. Yeah. So yeah. What was the the main reason, I suppose, behind changing it all? Was it just? I mean, the Mutilate is an awesome name as well. So <laughs> you know, you can't go wrong either way. But what was kind of the reason behind? changing it was it just the whole marketing campaign or were you not happy with, with how yeah it well or? uh originally i was gonna make two fall break it which explains why a group of college students can go away hmm. they're on what, what we call fall break thanksgiving vacation and the sequel was going to be spring break of course you know easter they were going to go somewhere else uh another movie was made called spring break yeah, but I didn't want it by then. Anyhow, I had it, cha- it was changed because the distributor didn't like what we had. And looking, if you compare the two, you know, really, first one was okay, but the second one is far superior. The mutilator is very straight to the point. You know, <laughs> you know yeah. <laughs> you're going into a film called The Mutilator. You know roughly what to expect. <laughs> <laughs> It's not a rom com. <laughs> <laughs> it's very good though. <laughs> the, the, mutil- <laughs> the mutilator and his wife. Yeah. <laughs> um, so there's also another thing about the mutilator, which I think is synonymous and everybody loves, including myself, is the the theme tune, the fall break theme tune. We're going on a fall break. Oh. It's just brilliant. In fact, me and my wife only we watched the film. Uh, I think I've had this for years, but for some reason she'd never seen it. I don't know why. And we watched it two nights ago because I was, I was like, I'm going to refresh my memory. Let's watch the mutilator. And as soon as the song came on, she looked at me and was like, what is this? Is this a horror film kind of thing? And it, it's so <laughs> perfect. Well, so yeah. what, what was the, uh, what was the idea behind the fall break song? And did you have an idea of how you wanted it to sound? Because for me, it's, it's iconic. It's iconic with this film. And it's so, it's such an earworm. It's so catchy. I just love it. So, uh, how did you come up with it? And uh, were you happy with yeah. the finished product on that one? Uh, to answer your questions in reverse order, yeah, I was very okay. happy with it. Uh, the, uh, there's a genre of music called beach music. Uh, people dance to it, a particular dance called the shag. And it's popular in southeastern U.S., particularly around North Carolina, South Carolina, Southern Virginia. And... Uh, I wanted, because the children were going to the beach, I I wanted the the theme song to be beach music style. And I wanted it to be light and cheery and bright because, well, you know, you don't want morbid music when you're going on a vacation or even (laughs) they're going to die, but you don't have to, the music doesn't have to foretell that. Uh, and so I relayed that to uh, Michael Menard, the composer, and sent a couple of samples of beach tunes to him. And he wrote the music. God, he's talented. And he enlisted the help of a friend of his named Alec. I can't remember. I think it was Alec. I can't remember the last name. Who actually wrote the lyrics for a big the beach music hit by the Drifters. Under the boardwalk, maybe you remember. Under the boardwalk, oh, okay. down by yeah, the yeah. sea. Anyhow, so that guy helped with the lyrics, and they came up with a really good. You know, it uh, played on the local hit parade for uh, a long time. People liked it, yeah. <laughs> and people, people jokingly complain about it being an earworm. I can't get that out of my head. It just, but they love it. People, I like. It. 
Oh, I mean, I don't think it's a bad thing being an earworm. I was singing it in work today because I had this tonight and it was just in my brain. I was just, I've been singing it all day and my colleagues at work are like, what is that song? Like, it's all great for the people later. It's, it's a classic. <laughs> it, is, it is. And uh, thanks to Michael Munro. I don't think there's another horror film that has um, such a catchy song that is so memorable like that, that's an original piece for the film. So I think, again, that it's just another layer of something that totally makes this film work. And it's brilliant, brilliant stuff. Um, so on the Arrow Blu-ray, there's a documentary. It's a feature-length docu documentary. And uh, I, I suppose for anyone listening, if you haven't got this Arrow Blu-ray, absolutely go and pick it up. You can get it in your local, probably HMV here in the UK. So worth a purchase. And the, the documentary, feature-length documentary on here is awesome. And a lot of the people, like the, the cast and the crew and even the locals from the area that feature on the documentary have nothing but really great things to say about the making of the movie. It sounded like it was just a, a super fun time. So did, did it feel that way for you as well with the, with the locals? And did it, it felt like a, a real community project in a way everyone from the police blocking the bridge <laughs> to you know people clamoring around shops to be part of the filming and being in the bars and did it feel like a community project when you were filming it because it it comes it across did. that way definitely on the documentary and <laughs> it, how great it, was, it was fun for everybody on the cast on the crew and in the town uh people were delighted to help uh and uh, we had for instance we were shooting uh, outside the, uh, a library, library, which uh, we put some signs up to make it look like a dorm, Halleck Hall. That's my daughter's name, Halleck. And uh, they were reconstructing a building in the next block. They had a drainage problem, a lot of water in the parking, below ground parking. So they had a pump running 24 hours a day to pump the water out, which interfered with the sound recording at our set at our location. And uh, so I called the woman who owned the building and explained it to her. She said, yeah, sure. And she sent a guy down to man the pump. And when we were getting ready to shoot, we'd wave, he'd turn the pump off. And after the shoot, we'd wave, he'd turn the pump back on. Glad to do it. I called the chief of police. We're getting ready to go over and shoot. And I said, if you want to touch base with you, make sure to Business manager called to let you know we're going to need some traffic control. Today. He said, when you need it? I said, about 15 minutes. He said, buddy, it's about, it's not, no, they didn't call. I said, I, you know, I don't know. I said, but we showed up and there they were. The police, even the chief was out there directing traffic. And the train, there's a train that comes through Moorhead City twice a day. And if it's coming through, it delivers to the port in Moorhead City and picks up. And it was coming through and it was coming, it was going to a long train, traveling slowly. And I said to the chief, I said, can you, can you stop the train while we <laughs> shoot this thing? He said, no, but I can speed it up. And he did. And they speeded the train up and got it out of the way so we could shoot. That's the kind of cooperation that we've got community-wide. Uh, the night that the deputy was decapitated, he invited all of his friends. It was done at the... Uh, on the outside the back patio of the the famous condo at the beach and the the patio of the condo next door had about 20 of his friends and family <laughs> and when he got his head cut off they all applauded <laughs> it was a lot of fun for everybody because <laughs> the i think the um <clears throat> the I, like I, got in. Right here. I think it's the light was that for me yeah. right there uh, it's not. No, I might I'm not a particularly vain person, but I look terrible. I need to no, get a not at all. Not at all. Look great. Uh, okay. <laughs> well, the, uh, the, the movie was, well, I think everyone stayed at your dad's uh, motel. Is that right? And they used, you used the pool to That's right. build. Yes. So, because yeah. there's a scene where obviously, I think it's uh, Mike and Linda are in the pool and it's filled with milk. Because you needed to uh, get the the uh, the shot so that it didn't you couldn't tell who was under the pool and it was all covered up by a cover presumably to film that scene. But did you get any 
pushback from the guests to the fact that the pool was completely filled with milk and I can't imagine it took a while to drain and refill. <laughs> uh, a couple of things. <laughs> uh, it wasn't completely filled with milk. A lot of milk was poured into the water so that you couldn't see as, as you proceed. Uh, and I don't think it took, I think maybe 24 hours of filtering the, the water cleared it up again. It wasn't much. The blue, the blue covering came from uh, a company who was repairing a roof at a motel in Emerald Isle, not far away, and they'd finished the job. We just asked them if we could borrow it. They said, yeah. They brought it down, pumped it up, and it was filled with air. It made a really pretty scene. It was blue, and there were plants in the background. It's one of the prettiest scenes in the movie, probably the prettiest. Uh, and, but we shut the pump off and shoot and turn the pump back on to keep it keep it inflated uh there were no problems or pushback from any of that everybody was glad to go along with it the people in the motel loved it back a few years after we made the movie i went to afi i went in uh moved to la in august of 91 and my father would keep sending requests for copies of the tape so i'd take the tape down to the duplicating place and get 10 copies and send them to him. And he was passing them out to his guests at the motel. They, they, he liked it. They liked it. The guests liked it. Yeah, no, there were no complaints from the guests, no. Awesome. And I can <laughs> imagine it's became, especially in uh, in these days, you have a lot of YouTubers and things where, you know, they go and, you know, uh, kind of look around filming locations and stuff like that. I can yeah. imagine that's maybe actually give the motel a little bit more business over the years, just like this is where, you know, for horror fans to go and see where the movie was made. Do, do they kind of get a lot of, I suppose, horror tourists, would that be the word? But, you know, going to have a look yeah, yeah, at yeah. where it was made. I don't think there's been much business given to the motel for that, but there's a guy, Kenny Caperton, who, who runs one of the types of operations you're talking about. He calls it uh, onset screaming. And he twice has shown the mutilator at the condo where it was shot, the famous condo at the beach. And the people who own it are glad for him to do that. They can they rent the rooms out to people who want to watch the movie and spend the night in that condominium. And uh, both times that he's done it, we've had uh, cast members come. We've set up tables, let them sign posters for the for the fans like that. Uh, but so the people who own that condo have benefited from it. Uh, but I don't, I don't think the motel has benefited very much. Maybe this time because there's more of the motel in it this time. Oh, okay. I suppose a bit like the, uh, it's a bit like the Myers house uh, where yeah. Halloween 78 was filmed. They use that now as a, a theater to show movies in the back garden. It's got like a big inflatable screen and uh, <clears throat> a lot of like indie horror film makers go there and premiere their movies at the Myers house. So it's very similar. You would do it at the, the condo at the beach. I think, I think that's awesome. There you go. Now this guy I was talking about, Kenny Caperton, uh, is a big fan and he was going to build a new house. He got plans for the Myers house and built an exact duplicate of the Myers house for his house. And he does a thing like that on Halloween and people come, he has uh, some acreage and people come and camp and park. He has an outdoor screen and he shows things. That's how I met him. We were invited to come show the mutilator, I guess around 16 or 17. And, uh, and we, Ed Farrell and I went and he asked us to autograph his house. We went, we went <laughs> in the kitchen, go in the kitchen and open the pantry door. And there's some shelves in there with plaque with wood on them. And people have autographed his kitchen, his house. <laughs> and so he invited us to autograph his house and we did. It was awesome. That's the only house. That's the only house we bought of the guests. Yeah, <laughs> that's very cool. That is very cool. So I, ho I hope you don't mind me asking this question. Um, right. You create the mutilator. You know, as I said, one of, personally one of the best standalone slasher movies in the eighties. Um, but then you don't make another film until now with the mutilator too. What was what was the reason behind essentially not making a another film after this because it, it, from the outside looking in you made one awesome film and then didn't make another one so what what was the reason behind that well it was not for lack of desire uh, 
we all wanted to make a new one, a new, another one. The day we finished shooting the first one, it was let's make, let's do it again. Yeah, everybody, cast and crew. And uh, it took a while to get it distributed, and then distribution went south. Uh, I had to pay the bank back. It took a while to get the money. My children grew up and they were going to college. I was on along the way. I was coaching t-ball, coaching softball, being a father, a husband, and practicing law. And I didn't have a lot of time. Didn't have any money because I had spent it all. And then I decided to go to film school. And just one thing after another kept getting in the way. Uh, well, I spent six years in LA putting packages together and uh, drew some interest, uh, but never sold me anything. And then my parents were getting elderly. My father didn't have anybody to rely on. He came home, uh, he died a year later. And I was asked by the family to take over the oversight of the family business, which is the motel and fishing pier, which took a lot of time. And I simply, I, had, I didn't have the money to do it or the time. I had the desire. And then in uh, 19, I had written a screenplay by, by then and with some help from others. And uh, we went into pre-production. Had a DP going Pavit Sevic from, uh, I met in, uh, at AFI, came in and took on uh, Ann Hale as a producer. We were going for it. And then the pandemic hit. So I just shut it on the back burner for a couple of years. And just one thing after another, it's hard to say why. Not because they didn't want to. I did mm -hmm. want to, always wanted to. And still want to. <laughs> well, that leads us nicely on. I think I think we'll talk we'll talk about it now. We'll, we've covered the mutilator, we've covered the original. Let's talk mutilator too. Because 39 years later, or probably 38 years later, whatever it was when you were filming this, probably last year, you finally get to do it. You get to do another movie, Mutilate 2, the long-awaited sequel. So how did it come about, basically? Because I can imagine this has been in the kind of pipeline for a long time. So how did the Mutilate 2 come about, and then you just thought, take the plunge and go and do it? I, I, I don't recall a specific moment when I pushed the go button. Uh, it just sort of happened. I, I was working on the screenplay and showing it to people and they were telling me how crummy it was and making suggestions and I was adopting most of those suggestions. Keith Farrell, who's dead now, was really good at, at offering suggestions. Um, and it just, then when, when after the pandemic, when I brought it off the back burner again, Goran, the, Goran Pavichevic, who was going to be the DP, had taken a position teaching at, in South Carolina, this, the art school. I can't remember, it's called Shack, something like Shack, and couldn't just couldn't get off. So I uh, went searching for crew. And Ann Hale, who was agreed to, had agreed to be a producer. I met Ann Hale at Kenny Kaplan's first time we showed the new letter there. She was very businesslike. And that night I said, if I ever make another one, I want you to be the business manager. She said, okay. So she came on as a producer and she brought along Jeff Seaman as a producer. And they, uh, Ann suggested Damien Mappy to act in it. Damien suggested Terry Kaiser to act in it, and the thing started snowballing. They suggested somebody for DP who knew somebody to be the uh, gaffer, and an actor knew another actor who put an ad in. I mentioned that I advertised in uh, Breakdown Services for Mutilator and got seven applicants. We advertised in Breakdown Services, which is now a, an online service, and got 500 applicants. Oh, wow. <laughs> so we, we went through all of it. Was, boy, every day going through dozens and dozens of headshots and things, looking looking for the people. That took a lot of time. Uh, but we wound up with an excellent 
cast. I mean, they are damn good. Uh, and we, uh, it just took on a lot. You, in my experience, when I start doing something, no matter what it is, and building a condo at the beach or making a movie or something, you, I, there seems to come a point in the process where the thing takes on a life of its own and it's going to happen whether you stay with it or, or die. And somewhere along the way, it reached that point. The thing took on a life of its own and it just almost made itself. I don't, yeah. I don't know. That happened. It started breathing on its own in uh, January, February last year. It just happened. I can't. I can't say. I can't. I, can't say, I can't say it any better than that. I think with um, it's a strain that I think the horror community and the horror scene at the moment is it's pretty incredible because there's a lot of very talented and very enthusiastic people about the sole genre of horror. So I can imagine that a lot of these people would have been just, I want to be on the mute layer too. It, it's not, it, it's, you know, the cast that are included. Uh, maybe I'm going up the wrong tree there, but did you find it easier this time around? Because everyone knew the franchise, if mm -hmm. you want to call it that now. They they knew the product. Yeah. They knew you, were, yeah. they knew you you on board yeah. and how much this film means to slasher fans and that it's easier yeah. to get more enthusiastic people who want to be in the movie rather than kind of talking people around. Is that kind of on the right track? There was, there was a lot of that. A lot of people really wanted to be in Mutilator 2. Uh, they wanted to be, they wanted to work on it. They wanted to act in it. Uh, they just did. Uh, and I'm glad I'm glad that they appreciate that first one enough. Moon. It's a guy named uh, Ryan James plays uh, my favorite character in the movie. Uh, had been corresponding with me for two years from the first time, from when I first started to get up. And he showed up with, uh, he had printed, as most of them had printed out the screenplay. He didn't print out just his size, he printed out the screenplay with colored tabs for his scene to flip through it. Completely different hair and, and facial hair, and uh, the guy was prepared and performed admirably, as did everybody. I was just bowled over by the talent. And I forgot what the question was, man. I got to talk about the actors too much. <laughs> what, what, what no, I suppose, was, was it easier casting because oh, everyone yeah. was so wanting to be on board? That didn't take any talking around. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you, oh, you mentioned. Uh, people in the horror genre, would they be interested? You know, you, I'm sure you're aware of the of Jen and Sylvia Soska, the Soska sisters, the Twisted Twins. Yes. American Mary. Uh, they're friends with Ann Hale, the producer, and I had done a modest thing for them, and they uh, suggested to Ann Hale a particular kill that would look good in New Later 2. It was a great idea. We used it. <laughs> so there are people in the horror genre who are interested in the production of New Literature 2 and offer contributions of uh, ideas and acting talent and working talent. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. It, it was a lot easier getting New Literature 2 made than it was getting New Literature 1 made. I bet. <laughs> Awesome. Sort of, sort of. Sort of. To an extent. Yeah, yeah. To an extent. It's a lot bigger, except for the size. It was easier to uh, to be believed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, the first time I'm making movie. Yeah, right. Everybody's gonna make a movie. Yeah, okay. Well, it happens. Uh, and this time, people knew about it. They were interested. They they knew. I'm surprised how many people knew about me. Uh, <laughs> Terry Codrick. Asked Terry Codd if he'd be in it. He said, Damien has suggested you and you'd be willing to play Jack Chatham. He kind of favored Jack Chatham. <laughs> and he said he would be honored to be in Mutilator 2 working with Buddy Cooper, who's a legend in the horror of genre. You know, got, <laughs> hey, Terry Codd, right? you got to love the guy. That's what I said at the top of the show. Uh, to horror fans, you are a, a legend. And you might not feel that way 
I don't know. Maybe you do now. Maybe I think it might be interesting. I don't, but it's a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but this this film, Mutilator 2, based on the trailer, and I think from a few things that you've said already previously, it seems to be much more of a, a meta movie, a movie within a movie itself. What was the idea behind that? Was it always, like even from all these years, planning Mutilator 2, was it always going to be that style movie? Or did that kind of... No, I didn't have any idea what it was going to be like until I started writing it. Uh, it's not so meta, meta as uh, people have gleaned from the trailer because there are a couple of shots of Mutilator 1 in there. That's a very small part of the movie and it fits nicely. Uh, this is a standalone movie. Uh, there are Easter eggs in there. I don't deny that, but this is not this is not a remake. Uh, we're not seeing Mutilator One again. No, this is Mutilator Two, and it's it's meta only in the sense that some of the original cast members are in it. There's a shot or two that's uh, seen in it, but it's not a meta. It's not all that meta. It's just not. Did because um, obviously they are original cast members coming back. I think most of them are coming back that are able to. But apart from Matt Midler, I think he's the only one who's not going to be in the film. Matt um, Midler and Francis Reigns uh, are yeah. not going to For the other cast members who are going to be in there, did uh, was that just a matter of calling them up and saying we're we'll making Mutilator Two? Do you want to be in it? And I can again, I can imagine they didn't take much talking round. Were they up for it and? No, they love it. Look, they had, everybody had a great time in Mutilator 1, and the cast stayed in close touch with each other. They became good friends through the years. Uh, yeah, call up Bill Hitchcock and Ruth Martinez. They, we're going to make another one. They said, thank God, it's about time. You know, let's do it. <laughs> and uh, Jack said, I can't. I just can't. But I'd like to come watch a shoot one time. Connie and uh, Bill and Maury Lampley uh, have, have since died, so they weren't available. Uh, my son was available for a cameo. You won't recognize it. My wife said, yeah, sure. My daughter was happy to jump in because she had such a small role the first time, I guess. But she's, she's, she's prominent in this one. Uh, yeah, the old cast was glad to come back on board. They had a good time then and they had a good time now. They had a good time on this one. Awesome. Bill, Bill uh, not only acted, but he acted as prop master. He was in charge of the props. And I'll tell you a funny story. <clears throat> he had an assistant from New York who uh, somehow had acquired the ability to roll a marijuana cigarette. And there's a little bit of marijuana smoking in this picture, but it's all phony marijuana. I don't know, there's a supply house that supplies things like that. And he got some artificial marijuana and they rolled up these artificial marijuana cigarettes and they had them in a bag laying on the prop table and they looked real. I mean, they looked real. They looked so real that somebody stole the baggie of artificial <laughs> marijuana cigarettes. I remember they had to make some more. I guess somebody's <laughs> off there thinking, this is bad yeah. shit. Yeah, no, no, no. See, they were going, score, bye-bye, and <laughs> jokes on them. Uh -oh. Uh, but yeah, so and, and the bill was prop master, and Ruth uh, assisted him in the props. It was just a close knit group. It really, they they were close knit in in the mutilator, and this was just a larger tribe in mutilator too. But everybody was still close knit. Everybody just is just a really good morale mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. permeated the whole set the whole time awesome i do have a question about the filming of the movie of the movie late too um did you ever wear the duke t-shirt filming from the uh, from the bet that you lost you've been talking to Anne. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. she, she she said that in <laughs> she uh she never presented me with the shirt to wear so everybody will know we bet on a basketball game and Tar Heels managed to lose that one. Uh, but I was prepared to wear it. I was going to cover it up with 
something else. And then I was going to wear on top of that a Carolina <laughs> T-shirt. So she'd make me pull that one off. I'd pull that one off, and there would be nothing under that. I had to pull that one off and finally get to the Duke T-shirt. I will probably wear it backwards or something. But uh, No, that didn't happen yet. We'll save that for the next one. <laughs> what uh, what was the bet? What did you lose? Was it a, a, a game? Uh, just, there? It was a basketball game, man. I said, "Wait, well, you want to bet? We bet a buck every now and then." And she said, "I'll bet you this: if you lose, you wear a Duke T-shirt on the set." And I said, "Okay," but uh, <laughs> I guess we were too busy to have that much. We had fun. We had a lot of fun. Yeah, good. I don't know. I don't know why that didn't happen. <laughs> Maybe for the next one. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, but, but I have a technical. I have a technical out on the next one, right? Now. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I can play lawyer. Yes, yeah. If there's anyone who knows the ins and outs, it'll be you. So that'll be. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one thing I noticed about the trailer of Mutilator Two is there is a very prominent cameo from a current slasher icon, and that is Art the Clown, one of my favorite uh, slasher characters of the last ten years. Damien Leone, David Howard Thornton, they're doing incredible things. Um, are you a fan of modern day slashers, the likes of Terrifier and Terrifier 2? Uh, I, I don't watch many of them. Uh, I am a fan of, uh, as I said, American Mary and the Sausage Sisters. And I came upon Terrifier, I don't know, a, year, a couple of years ago, just by accident. I started watching it and I'm thinking uh, another clown horror movie. You know? And within just a few seconds, it was different. You could tell it was different. So I started yeah. watching it, and I really liked it. And I bumped. He was at the Mad Monster Party in Charlotte last year, and we were there. We, we set up a table, and I introduced myself to, and uh, told him how much I liked the Terrifier, and that in this movie, there would be some uh, iconic horror villains in the background, just briefly. And I, I, I had planned to put Art the Clown in there, and I hope he didn't mind. He said, no, that's fine. Go ahead. So there's Art the Clown. Played by uh, Jeff Seaman, the producer, incidentally. Oh, uh, okay. The man, I was going to ask man, him. Dumb, the... the man who was going to play Art the Clown had to work that night and couldn't, couldn't get over. So Jeff jumped in at the last minute and filled the suit. And I, uh, I've told this story before. I walked up on the set. Uh, I guess Jeff was putting his costume on. Jeff was acting as first assistant, first as assistant director, and the, the set was busy with camera people and, and props and other people and people just standing around, some talent. And I walked up on the set and I said, "Where's that clown that's supposed to be running this show?" <laughs> like that, everybody looked at me chagrined that I would talk about Jeff that way. And uh, about that time, he came walking up in his in his costume, and everybody got the joke. But it was okay. For a second there, everybody was startled that I was being so rude. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, because it's funny because with Terrifier, the kill, obviously, that everyone talks about in the original Terrifier is the upside down kill with the hacksaw. Yeah. And it is very, obviously, it's extremely graphic. It's all on screen, but it's kind of reminiscent of the gaff kill in the original Mutilator. Like it's you know it's it's generally an area of the body that you don't see get you know mutilated. I suppose in horror films, it takes a lot of balls to do it. So maybe Damien did Damien say anything about that in terms of did he get any inspiration from you for that kill or no? He didn't say anything about that. What he said was he wouldn't let me use his act to play on the clown. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I bought a mask. I bought that, the mask that we use at that particular show right across the aisle from his table was the guy selling masks and he had an art clown mask. I got that and I walked it back over and got Damien and the actor to autograph that mask. And if you could free frame and blow that mask up, you'd see their autographs on there. Awesome. It was just, just an interesting aside, yeah. Yeah, I met them both at um, a convention in Manchester a couple of months ago. Two really great guys and... Uh, it's just awesome to see indie horror doing so well. It's I think we're in a golden age of indie horror where yeah yeah he, he killed it at the box office. The last reading I got was something like eleven million dollars. Yeah, and uh, well deserved. I mean, it's, it's, it's that, I haven't seen you later too. I'm looking forward to it. But you later one was really one of my favorites. Yeah. So I'm that actually would lead me on to this question: where yeah. 
similar to Terrifier, mutilate it too. I would imagine it's going to be a an indie. It's an indie film. It's you know going to get a. Are you going to give it a theatrical release, or is it going to go on to a limited theatrical release and see how it goes? What's the uh, what's the plan for getting the movie out there? Well, the distributor would have an awful lot to say about that. I would hope for a theatrical release, uh, and I can't do much more than hope at this point. Okay. It'll be one of the things that we talk about when I talk to the distributor. Uh, yeah. But if they come in with uh, an adequate advance, they buy the right to make the decisions. Yeah. (laughs) When um, do you think the movie will be released? Whereabouts are we in terms of the post-production and all that kind of stuff? Uh, How long do you think it'll be till it's out there in the the public domain? It is uh, 99% finished. There are a couple of little video works that need to be tweaked and maybe four or five audio levels that need to be adjusted either up or down and that's about it. Uh, I have posted it on Vimeo and I've, there are three distributors interested at this time and I've sent links and passwords to each of them uh, over the holidays. I haven't heard of one of them. I heard from a couple of days ago said I saw your trailer online. When am I going to get to see it? And I said God I sent the link to you a week ago. Uh, let me resend it. And I was looking to get ready to send it again. I got a second email from him and said, never mind, I got it. It went in the wrong folder. <laughs> so the distributors have it and they're looking at it. But uh, I feel like the holidays is pushing them behind. And sometime maybe in the next couple of weeks, I'll hear something. But I, at this time, I have nothing to report except that my hopes are, are uh, high. There's been a lot of buzz about it online. Definitely. I mean, I was I was actually going. I didn't I didn't have time this afternoon when I got home from work, but I was going to count up the the views from all the YouTube uh, hits, and it's it's been on Instagram, it's been on Facebook, and there must be hundreds of thousands, like close to hundred thousand hits, or even more on the trailer. There is yeah, so I, much I, I, buzz about the movie. Did you did you expect people to be this? hyped for you later too or did you think it was just gonna we'll put it out there and see what happens because a lot of people yeah, have waited a long time for this now jeff seaman the producer i've mentioned uh had a contact at fangoria magazine fangoria sent a reporter down who was on set for a while uh it might even be in in one of the crowd scenes uh they have an article that they've been waiting i thought it was coming out in the december issue but they contacted Jeff somehow and wanted an exclusive release on the trailer. So I agreed to that and I let them have it a couple of days ahead of putting it out publicly. And they wrote a really nice article. I don't know if you visited their website and seen that article in the trailer. And it, it went, uh, it, it got, uh, it became very active as a result of that. Uh, it had over 6,000 views the first 24 hours, which I thought was really good. And then uh, a couple of days later, I put it out on, uh, on on several groups that I'm a member of, and people, the actors and the and the crew, people are sharing it. It's moving around, moving around a lot. If I knew how to count how many hits it had, I'd do that. I'd, well, how do you do that? You went on YouTube. You I, went well, on YouTube? Know, just literally, just went on YouTube, and I think because. Lots of different kind of websites. They say Fangoria, Bloody Disgusting, and loads of kind of trailer websites on YouTube have all posted it. Must be, in fact, I'll just have a quick, while I'm, uh, let me just have a quick look because I'm fairly sure if we just, uh, the mutilate, mutilate to trailer. So, I mean, one, the first one here has 12,000 views. Um, this one. Do, 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 do. My phone's rubbish for this kind of thing, but there is um, multiple trailers on here for it, and it all has like say, each one has kind of 20,000, 12,000. There's oh so m- they're just, they're just adding up, adding up, and yeah, it's uh, there's so much buzz, which is great to hear. It's great, you know, you, you don't want to put something out there and get nothing, so it is <laughs> really know. exciting. Yeah, yeah, it's very encouraging. I do like you think? Yeah, I mean, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you there. Um, I was just yeah, going to ask you. Um, 
do you think the kills and the gore in Mutant without giving too much away, do you think the kills and the gore, uh, most of the kills, I suppose, would will top or match the original Mutilator? Where do you think that's going to be in terms mm. of the bar? I think there'll be a match. Uh, <laughs> I didn't. I didn't try to exceed what was there before. Uh, I just uh, the kills that sort of work themselves into the writing. That's okay. That's what happened. It's a. It's it's gory, uh, <laughs> and it's it's. Uh, I don't want to say too much about it. <laughs> no, that's cool. Get no. it It'll be a surprise. It'll be a surprise. We, we're going into Mutilator 2. We know what we we're expecting. So it's going to be... I'm really looking forward to it. I It's one of my most anticipated movies of this year, to say the least. <laughs> well, I sincerely hope you're not disappointed. I don't know. I'm, I'm fairly sure it will be. I mean, uh, I know we haven't even got the Mutilator 2 out there. We haven't even got that out there yet. Obviously, there's a bit of a process to go from that. But do you see yourself making... If this is a huge success, which I think it will be, I personally think this is going to be another big success. Do you think you'll make a Mutilator 3? If uh, I was on a podcast with uh, Justin Powell last night, and he asked me the same question. And after I gave him words, if I get 75% of my money back, I'm, I'm happy to make another. I'd like to make another one. I'd love to make another one. Uh, but they're expensive. Yeah, well... One thing I was going to, I mean, it's possibly something that you've spoke about with your team and, and all that kind of stuff, but in today's kind of economy, a lot of filmmakers stick a kind of a, a campaign on Indiegogo and stuff like that, you know, so people can back the movie and, uh, you know, maybe get like a DVD or a poster or a digital download or something like a reward for backing the film. And there's so many films out there that have, so much backing from those kind of things. Would you ever consider that, or would you prefer to just do things as as they are? Or, um... well, uh, it took a few years to save up enough money to make a um, year or two. Uh, the budgets that I've seen on those Indiegogo and Kickstarter campaigns would be inadequate mm. for a year production. And I just don't think I could raise the kind of money that, that I would require on one of those. So yeah. the answer is probably not. No, I've had no. fans in, over the past few years have offered to run those campaigns for me, but uh, you know, it's, it's just not enough money. No, no, I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. I think um, with a franchise like The Mutilator, I think there's a lot of people out there who would be I mean, I don't know. Because let's, for example, say if the trailer tell, tell, had tell them to send money. <laughs> well, just, I don't know, but say if the trailers had a hundred thousand views, one hundred fifty thousand views, and half of those people wanted to donate ten dollars, <laughs> you never know. <laughs> but it's something though. It's something. This might be a good time to start an Indigo campaign for Mutilator Three before Mutilator Two. Before we even get it out, <laughs> while the trailer is still hot. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you'll you'll get the Mutilator three as a double package with Mutilator two. <laughs> um, so obviously, we're aiming for a twenty twenty three release. It's looking that way. Um, will you be attending any conventions or uh, like appearances in in promotion for the film? I've been invited to a few. Uh, finishing this movie has been hard work, and I'm kind of tired. Uh, Carl Grasso, one of the actors, wants to go to Mad Monster Party in Charlotte next month. Uh, and I just don't think I'm going to be able to go. I've been invited to Orlando, Barcelona. They're the only ones I can think of right now. And I'm, mm -hmm. uh, uh, right now, it's just not a good time for me. I need to put my feet up, get caught up on my other stuff. Uh, but I may encourage some of my people to go to the Mad Monster Party in, in February in Charlotte and supply them with posters and caps and T-shirts mm -hmm. and stuff. But personally, it's a little bit iffy for me right now. Mm -hmm. It just is. But I'm available. I'll be, I'll be bouncing back soon. Good. 
Good. I mean, I would love to see you at a UK convention. Uh, we have quite a few horror conventions here in the UK, and I think you would go down a real storm. Because I, I don't think, we were saying before we went on air, have you never been to the UK? No, I, I was uh, mutilated. I've been mutilated went to a, uh, a contest in Paris uh, at a horror movie something. And uh, I've never been. I, I'm fond of the UK. I mean, I've been there. I've never mm. been there in, in its capacity. But I'd love to go to the UK. To the UK, I want to go anyhow. Well, so, I'll uh, put a word in with the guys the at the, there you go. the of Horror Convention because I think, genuinely, I, I think you would go down a storm because people, I think there's so many fans of this movie and, you know, I think in terms of posters, autographs, I think there'd be, I think you would be uh, a real hit at something like that, especially here. So I think that would, uh, fingers crossed. <laughs> okay. But speaking of which, um, is how do people, if they can't meet you at a convention, uh, how do people, I suppose, get your autograph or merchandise? Is there a place where that's available online? Or we had a uh, an Instagram store that was hacked and shut down as a result. Um, people. Send a message to me on Facebook saying they want a poster. I have, and I'll send them an invoice on PayPal. Posters are eleven dollars. I still got a few forty fives left there, eleven dollars. The new posters are being printed now, or they're about to be printed. They'll be printed in the next few days, and the, pr- the cost of printing has gone up. So these new posters are going to be a little more expensive. They may be. 14 15 dollars shipping is 650 and people send a message to me say i'm on a poster how much is it and i said send me send me your email address and i'll send you an invoice so if someone were to want a poster uh they can send me their email address and i'll send a paypal invoice awesome and is that signed 16 11 dollars signed poster it's it's not. I understand they go for a lot more than that on eBay, but yeah, I'd rather get them out there. Than, I'm not That's trying awesome. to make a pro- profit on them. Somebody wants a poster of my movie, I want them to have it. I'll <laughs> hold them up for another fifteen or twenty bucks. It's not worth it. I'd rather That's, make uh... them happy. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, that's that's brilliant. I mean, I think I'll get one off you then. In that in that case, I'll send me your PayPal invoice. Uh, however much the shipping is to the UK, I, I have your uh, mailing address. I'll send one to you. Awesome. I'll, I'll be happy to do it. Anything that'll help because that's uh, that's a great deal. So anyone out there who wants Buddy's autograph uh, or a poster or anything, uh, just drop a message and then I'm sure you can get that sorted. So where do uh, people find you, Buddy? In terms of Social media. I know the Mutilator Two. There's the Mutilator Two page on uh, Instagram, which Anne runs. That's how I got your email. She kindly passed that over to me. Uh, so, how do people keep? Is that the best way to keep all things up to date with all things Mutilator, or do you have your own socials that you want to uh, plug? You know, no. Uh, Anne's running the Instagram uh, site, and. She, uh, Anne's competent. I don't. I haven't even checked it up in several months. But uh, whatever's new and noteworthy is going to be up there. I, there's a mutilator Facebook page that has a lot on it. My own personal Facebook page is not all that interesting, so there's, <laughs> there's no need to go there. But uh, if you just want to send a message, send it to the mutilator Facebook page. Awesome. Perfect. That's the only thing that I've got. Great. I got a. I'm not on Twitter or Instagram. I've got an Instagram account, but I don't use it. Yeah. What else is popular? Well, TikTok. To be honest, I don't do TikTok. Use, uh, that's TikTok. Yeah, TikTok. That would be a good one. Um, I only use Facebook in it. I've literally only started using Instagram in the last two months. Um, just to kind of. Uh, it's just, I feel like, a bit of a nicer platform than Facebook and to kind of get the podcast out there and stuff. So um seems working. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll look into it. I understand Facebook is old-fashioned, but I've got, gee, through the years, I've picked up over 3,000 friends. And, 
you know, if they, I hate to abandon people. I, I'd have to do two. I don't want to do two. One's <laughs> enough. <laughs> well, that's one. awesome. Well, buddy, I really, really appreciate your time. I think we've gone over an hour and a half uh, on the call. So that's fantastic. And I, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to come on the podcast and been very gracious with your time and answering all the questions. So uh, it's been a real pleasure. It's been a real pleasure speaking to you. And uh, I really hope the Mutilator 2 is a massive success. Thank you, Ryan. It's been a pleasure for me to be here. We've had a lot of fun here today. I'll get that poster out to you and uh, take care. Perfect. Thank you very much, buddy. And uh, stay safe and enjoy the rest of the year. And uh, we'll keep in touch, uh, especially with the, uh, yeah, yeah. the release of the film. And I can't wait to see it. <laughs> okay. Okay, good. Thanks again. No bother. Perfect. Bye.